Yes, shalom, Chavarim, shalom, shalom. Yes, this is Ras Ayadonis Tafar, this is Yad in here. So the question is, is the Bible more reliable than Western history, than Western Gentile history? Is the Bible more credible based on the evidence, the real evidence that we have than Greco-Roman history combined and Western history? You know, we always hear ones and ones say, well, who wrote the Bible? Did Moses really write the Torah? You know, who wrote the Old Testament? When was the New, New Testament written? When was the Old Testament? What's the oldest manuscripts of this or that? And that's, that's a valid question, you know, for the science of it, for the knowledge of it, for the research and investigation. But the question we're asking here is the Bible both speaking of the Hebrew Bible, like the Old Testament, what's called like the New Testament, right? or the Greek, the New Testament, not all of the New Testament was written just in Greek, but just for the sake of the reasonment here, is the Bible more reliable than Western history? In other words, ones will say, well, the Israelites was not in Egypt, some say, you know, some say, well, where's the proof? Where's the evidence of it? Some say, well, Moses, Moses couldn't write the Torah because in Deuteronomy, it speaks about him dying and him being buried. Actually, it speaks about Yahuwah or Jehovah, you know, Hashem or the, the Lord, if you please, burying him. But be that as it may, throughout the scripts, we see Moses writing. We also know that the Levites and the Israelites were very literate. In fact, even the commandments given to the children of Israel was to write these things upon their gates. So that means that the Israelites the rank and file Israelites could write as well. So this is very unique about the B'nai Yisrael, the children of Israel, the Hebrews. If we look at the narrative, that they were literate. Right? They were literate. This is a big difference than even the latter day, even Israelites today, compared to Israelites coming out of Mitzrayim, coming out of the Het Kapita, Egypt, Egypt, or Kemet, then that they were literate. Right? We know that Moshe, what he wrote based on the Torah, that he did write the Torah. When we say the Torah, the direction instructions. And that he passed this on and communicated this to the priests. The priests, the Levites, they were the custodians, right? Even in the Torah, some of the five books of Moses said they were the custodians of these writings. And also what he wrote and communicated this to Yehoshua, to Joshua, and also that Joshua wrote. And the Israelites also wrote because the commandment in Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 4 to 9 it says to write these words that means that how could you keep the commandment unless you was literate to write so writing among the children of Israel even coming out of Egypt was not like today where we have a, a high level of functional illiteracy not so based on the Hebrew and the Torah narrative. But here, we're seeking to ask a fundamental question. And so what is this question? Well, is the Bible more reliable, more evidenced, you know, more provable, right, based on the facts than Western Gentile history, than Roman history? They say, well, Moses never existed, and this one never existed, and Yeshua, Jesus, they say never Well. Did Caesar exist? This is the question here. Did Caesar, did Caesar, did Caesar even exist? Did, did Julius, Julius Caesar Kaiser, or as they say, Julius Caesar, did he even exist? Who was he? You know, we hear this narrative about Julius Caesar, and I think most of you all have heard this, and we're going to show some, some proofs right here to back up what we're presenting here. This is part of our research right here, and just to share this right here, because a lot of ones, you know, they come at us, you know, with the scriptures, the Bible, whether the King James Version translation, you know, which they, most ones can barely read and understand. Right? Much less going into the Hebrew and the, and, the, and the Greek. You know what I mean? It's all Greek to them. We go into the New Testament as we have the evidence. But did Julius Caesar even exist? You know, we hear the narrative that Julius Caesar, he crossed the Rubicon. And Julius Caesar, he went all up into, he conquered Gaul, which is like France. And then he went up into Britannia, you know, which is Great Britain, England today. And we all heard the story about, you know, from Shakespeare, right, concerning Julius Caesar. You know, people take that Shakespeare play as, as actually history, but it's actually Shakespeare's play that was written about, 
about 15, almost 1600 years after the actual time of the one that they call Julius Caesar. So did Julius Caesar even exist? What is narrative? Et tu brute? Did he even say that? Did it even happen like that? You know, what about the Cleopatra, right? Mark Anthony, Julius Caesar, and Cleo. Uh, great movie if you think so, you know what I mean? But did it really even happen? Well, people take that as history. They teach that in school as history. But yet, they want to throw shade on the Bible. But there is more evidence, there's more proof, there's more manuscripts and ancient manuscripts, manuscripts that's proven to have been written within the approximate time of the events written about for the Bible, both for the Old Testament and the New Testament. We're going to zoom in on the New Testament first and get into the Old Testament. We're going to compare the Old Testament manuscripts with the manuscripts right, that are available for Greco-Roman Greece Greek and Roman history combined because this latter day this world system is built on a you know a Greco-Roman might a Greek Roman might paradigm that's all we have democracy they say from the Greeks and we have the Republican Republicanism and the Republic for which it stands that comes from the Romans so the roots right of this Western Gentile culture Anglo-American world order and system is this Greco-Roman thing Right? And this might explain to you right, this war of Hellenism, right? this Hellenism war against Hebrew. Right? Against the Hebrew, when we say the Hebrew, we're talking about the Israelites. When we say the Israelites, we're talking about the Yehudi, the Jews, even we, the black Jews of the line of the tribe of Judas. We got Robeno, Yeshua, HaMoshiach, who the world calls Jesus Christ. So let's get some proof right here. So that question is, did Julius Caesar ever, did he even exist? And if he did exist... What's the truth about his existence? Do we have the truth about it or do we have Shakespeare? We have Shakespeare's the Julius Caesar, you know, at Tu Brute, you all seen that before? I mean, it's a wonderful story. This story that we're told is taught in schools. Right? You do a whole bunch of movies and, and, and documentaries and history channel saying that these things are actual facts. Did Alexander the Great even exists? I mean, have they found his body? You ever seen his body on display? How do we know he exists? Did they ever find his body? Did they ever find out where he was buried? Julius Caesar, Alexander the Greek, or the Great, Mark Anthony, any of these guys, any of these people that we hear about in his, we know that there was a Cleopatra, right? Because we have some evidence from ancient Egypt, but what about Julius Caesar? Did he really exist? And what about this, this story? Right? The story that we have been made to be naive. But then they come to the Bible because they know that most ones right, are ignorant about the real history of the Bible. They know they can tell most folks anything. And most people, even with, you know, this high power technological equipment right here, you know, they shall go to and fro information, technology and knowledge shall be increased that most ones won't even look it up. Right? They won't even look it up for themselves, just to verify. Some nice videos out there, well edited, well manicured, sound, music, lights, cameras, action. But it's more of that so-called BS. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's more of that BS. And, and why do they call something BS? I thought that, that the cow and the animal manure, it was good for the soil. We'll touch on that one next. But right here, let's, let's, let's prove this particular fact right here that there's more history right is the bible more reliable more evidence in a sense more provable is there more proofs concerning the scriptures the old testament and the new testament than there is for greco-roman history for greek ancient so-called greek and roman history combined is there more evidence now all praise to Abba Father of I and I, Black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Robeno Yeshua HaMoshiach. So here, 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 let's touch on this first, dating of manuscripts. My dating of manuscripts. And you can look this up for yourself, dating of manuscripts. What we're here doing is comparing the manuscripts for the Bible, in particular right here for the New Testament, but also going to touch on the Old Testament, but for the New Testament of the Bible, right, compared with Greco-Roman history, right? The Greek and Roman history. Because we hear a lot about Greek and Roman history. Nobody questions whether 
Alexander the Greek, Alexander the Great, Alexander the Macedonian, whether he ever even really existed. We all take it that he did exist. And we all hear the same narrative told over and over. But where's the proof of that? We hear about Julius Caesar, right? You know, how he conquered Gaul, how he went into Britannia, how he crossed the Rubicon, right? How they wanted to make him king, how he refused the crown or three times, how they stabbed him up in the Senate, how he said, et tu brute. But is this real history? Nobody questioned. Did he even exist? Have they ever found, have they ever found any of the bones of any of, people talk about, well, where's the bones of the people in the Bible? Where's the bones of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob? They want the bones of the patriarchs. They said they haven't found no bones nowhere. They're looking for bones, 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 bones. Well, how about these bones for you? Where's the bones of the Roman emperors? Where's the bones of Julius Caesar? Where's the bones of Mark Anthony? Where's the bones of Alexander the Greek, Alexander the Great? Do we even know if these people even really existed? And how do we know they even existed? Let's compare this to the Bible, because this is approximately the same period of time, right? The same period of time. So here we have, let's look at the work, Plato. Plato, there are seven manuscripts, right? They were written approximately between 427 to 447 BC. That's before the common era, the Christian era, right? The earliest known copy, right? Notice the earliest known copy <laughs> is 900 AD. Hold, hold on, hold on for a moment. 900 AD? Plato. You heard about Plato, right? You heard about Plato. Plato's cave and Plato's this and Plato's that and they talk about platonic you know that's what they get you know we have a platonic relationship that's what they get from Plato you know Plato's philosophy so from someone right but allegedly right there are seven of these manuscripts they say that this was Plato allegedly allegedly was written roughly around 427 to 447 BC but the earliest copies that we have today and that they have to show us for Plato is 900 A.D. How do we know that Plato wasn't written in 900 A.D.? They say, well, Plato is said to have lived roughly around that 400 B.C. time, but the earliest known copies is 900 A.D. The earliest known copies, 908. Notice it, the earliest known copy. <laughs> All right? It says copy. You copy? Check, check. Time span between when Plato was allegedly written, right, and the earliest known copy, 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 check, was 1,200 years, 1,200 years. Now we're supposed to believe that, right? So when they tell us about Plato, right, they say, oh, there was Plato, right, Platonic, Plato this, Plato that, and the earliest known copy is 900 AD? That means that the earliest known copy was a little over 1,100 years ago, 1,100 years ago. How do we know they didn't write it? What about the Gallic Wars? You heard about the Gallic Wars, these ancient wars, right? There's a whole manuscript. We read it in the Gallic Wars, you know, ancient Greco-Roman history, blah, blah, blah. Well, that is said to have been written between 100 to 44 B.C. 100, and this is the time of Julius Caesar, right? Julius Caesar, Kaiser. 100 to 44 B.C. But look at this, the earliest copy, copy, not original, copy, copy, yeah, the earliest known copy, check, copy, 900 AD, 900 AD, just like play. How do we know that these two wasn't written around the same time? Now, between the time that they said the Gallic Wars originally was written, that they say, and there's only 10 manuscripts, right, is 1,000 years, 1,000 years, and we're supposed to believe that, okay. How about Tacitus? Tacitus, the Roman historian. Tacitus, right? They say there's 20 manuscripts, right, that they can point to, right? They say when it was written, 100 AD. They say that Tacitus, the Roman historian, now I said that Tacitus, he witnessed, you know, destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem, you know, and what occurred and what happened to the Yehudi, the Jews and everything. And he even says that the, the Jews that he witnessed were of the race, the Prolem Ethiopicum, were of the race of the Ethiopians. We think that's a very interesting point. He makes mention of that as well as other, we could say Hebraic, Judaic, Israelite, and also Ethiopian black people connection. But they say that the when this was written is 100 A.D., but look at the earliest copy, 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 one, 
1100 AD. Mm. That's about 1000 years at the earliest copy. I gotta emphasize copy. Do you copy? Right, the copy, the earliest known copy. So there's a thousand years apart from the so-called uh, more original manuscripts and then we get this, this gap, this time span gap, this big gap, a thousand years. And yet they wanna ask folks, right, who affirm the truth of the Bible, you know, especially by these translations, in these translations, they'll say, oh, oh, the, the, the Bible is not as old as such and such, and did this exist, did that happen, how do we know this? Well, we're about to get to that. Let's touch on Pliny, Pliny or Pliny, 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 Pliny. Seven copies of Pliny, Pliny. They say it was written 100 AD. The earliest copy, you see it, you see it there, y'all watching the video, 850 AD. This is a time span, the difference between the earliest copy and when it is alleged to have been written is 750 years. 750 years. Wow. And, and, and we still believe that, right? You know, ones go to school and they study this. I remember being in school in college. This is like kind of mandatory. You got to know the history of the Western civilization. Right? Because there's proof. This really happened. Not like the mythology of the Bible, but this is really real. Really, really, really? Is it really? Is it really? The Iliad. You heard about the Iliad. Right? The Iliad. Now, notice this. Of the Iliad, like Homer. Right? Remember Homer? And we really think that Homer was an Ethiopian Asmari. Right? Let me just put this on record. That Yadin, Ras, Iadonis, Tafari. Right? He speculates. You can, you can say that. I speculate whether Homer was an Ethiopian Asmari. The Asmari were like musicians, singers. They would sing history. You know, they were almost like, like in, in verse and in poetry. Right? They would compose history. They would kind of tell history in kind of poetical prose and verse, so forth and so on. Like Something like the Iliad, right? Well, the Iliad... Notice that Iliad has 643 number of manuscripts that they found. They say that when it was written was 900 B.C. At least with the Iliad. At least with the Iliad. The earliest copy is in the B.C. Right? 400 B.C. Now that's a 500 years later. So we have when it was written. Now when it was written, we just assume it was written because this is what they tell us. Right? How, how do we really know it was written then? But since these events occurred around this time, we can roughly trust the general timeline. But look at the gap, 500 years. Now, notice the New Testament, right? And we say the New Testament, we need to distinguish between the portions of the, that was written in Greek and also non-Greek. Remember that the people like Yeshua, Yeshua was a Yehudi, he was a Jew, even like we, the black Jews of the line of the tribe of Judah, he was a Jew, they spoke Hebrew. Right, and Aramaic, right? And let's not think that there's, even if they spoke Greek, you know, like many people who are bilingual or trilingual might do, if they have their own language that's important to their religion, their spirituality, their culture, how are we not to think that they're not going to communicate in their own language, Hebrew or Aramaic, right? But let's look at the New Testament here. New Testament, generally speaking, the number of manuscripts, 5,686. 5,686. And when written from 40 to 100 AD, right? Now, this means that the writing and the documenting of the events that were so witnessed happened at the same time, in the same time period, right, as when the events took place, right? The earliest copy of the New Testament is 125 AD. Look how close that is to the time, right, when written. And the time span between when it was written and the earliest copy, copy, check, copy, that we have, right, is 30 years, a 30-year time span. So just based on this right here, based on this exhibit right here, which one is more reliable? This puts Greco and Roman history into a big question mark. But of course, they're not going to question it because that's all they have to work with. Notice how the Western Gentile civilization, they question Right? We say Afro-Asiatic, Afro-Shemitic culture. They'll question everything that we have, right? Yet we have more proof for what we claim, our claims, than they have proof for their claims. But it did say that we'll be in times like these, the times of the Gentiles, right? Where they'll put their, you know, Gentile philosophy forward, 
right? But all we need to do, right, is to use our reasoning and discernment. It's clear right here that there's big gaps, right, right, big gaps from 500 to over a thousand years between various documents. I mean, these are primary doc. These are the, really the only documents that they point to when they want to tell us about ancient so-called Greek and Roman history. These are the very documents that they regurgitate over and over and over again. And then they'll try to cast so shade right on the Hebrew, we can say the Hebrew Bible, right? Or it's called the Old Testament. And even most more so on the New Testament. But check this out. Check out what we're showing you here. Take a snapshot, take a screenshot of this. We have some more to come. Yeah, yeah. You don't think you don't think it has to do with some racism, do you? No, no, not that, right? <laughs> you don't think you don't think it's something something racially motivated? Right, about all these lies and prevarications that be going about. All right. Well, here, here, here. It's interesting that now we can see a lot of early art, and there's so much Christian art where it's kind of clear that the people were not portraying the people of the Bible as white people. You know, at least in the modern sense, right? You know, of what we call it, right? But it's very clear how they pictured, you know, the people of the book. You know, of the Old Testament and the New Testament. So you don't think that there's something racially motivated, seeing that there's more evidence, right? More manuscripts, right? More manuscripts for the New Testament, right? And even the Old Testament than there is for Greco and Roman history combined. Notice they never found any body of, of, of Julius Caesar. So did he, did he even exist? Where was he buried? Nobody even asked those questions. Have you ever heard anybody ask, well, did Alexander the Great exist? Some people would just laugh it off. This guy's crazy. How's he asking whether Alexander the Great? We all know Alexander the Great existed. How do you know? How do you know? From, from the writings? What writings? When were they written? How many copies of them? Right? Is there any um, um, corroborating evidence? All right. So, uh, uh, racial motivation? Uh, that's interesting. Uh-oh. Ancient manuscript comparison chart. Are you ready to compare right here, here, here? Ancient manuscripts. Let's zoom this in so ones can see this large. Because this is the area, you know, where a lot of so-called, you know, some of these other ones and ones, they don't really go into these areas. You know what I mean? But hopefully maybe they might, you know, catch something from this and say, you know what? This is a very good point of view, right? Because this is looking at scientific, factual evidence. You know what I mean? This is like bean counting. Here we call this bean counting. So ancient manuscript comparison chart. So we're looking at, you know, Greco-Roman history vis-a-vis -vis the Hebrew, Jewish, Judaic, New Testament, right? So let's start out right here. The author, right? So we have Lucretius. Right? He is said to have died 55 or 53 B.C. Right? That's like 55 or 53 years before the Common Era. So before we can say the New Testament, you know, the New Testament begins. And we didn't even talk about the apocryphal books. Right? That's that 400 years between the Old Testament and New Testament. Why the apocryphal matters? Because that's at least 400 years of history. Right, of history that the early church and the early Christian before these latter day, you know, um, white Anglo Saxon Protestant kind of hijacked the whole thing, you know, that was accepted. So we have to investigate well, why was that not accepted? They just say, well, it's not inspired. Mm. You know why they say it's not inspired? Because it speaks against the Greco Roman thing. You have to recognize that what's important to the Western Gentile, the whitewashed world, is that Greco Roman thing. That's where they get their power from, right? That's why we have democracy and Republican, right? Coming from the Greek and the Roman world. This is why we have the legal system and everything that comes down to this very day, right? It is the core of their system, right? They kind of use the Bible stuff as a kind of deflection, right? But since more of we people, the ones lost now found, are becoming more awakened, right, to this, this half of the story, why that white supremacy didn't want to tell us like the picture we just showed you right there they, they would never have shown that but you know what we just get to know these things now many of them and their ancestors and the rest of them that wrote all these um racist and 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 bias and 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 erroneous historical narratives and twisted up the historical evidence they already knew those things 
right? This will explain why they did to our ancestors over 400 years what they did to them. Because they already knew these things, right? It says in the Woolly Lynch, How to Make a Slave Paper, unless some phenomena occurred, right? Unless some phenomena, that phenomena that occurred is the birth of that man, child, that was born there like Psalm 87 verse 4 with Ethiopia this man was born there but here 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 let's look at this ancient manuscript comparison chart so we have Lucretius right they say this was written right they say well he died around that time so they assume that sometime hopefully before he died he wrote this it's not known the earliest copy notice that the earliest copy is not known but the approximate time span between the original and the copy is said to be 1,100 years. So how many copies do they have? They have two copies. And as far as the accuracy, they can't give any accuracy because they only have two copies to go on. Lucretius. Lucretius. Where's all their proof? Right? But yet you believe them, right? Well, plenty. This is also facts that they know is true. Right? You need to look at these facts and accept these facts, credit these facts, admit as true these facts. Pliny, Pliny, we touched on him, right? He is said to be written in A.D. 61 to 113, right? Now compare that with what we had um, previously, right? Now the earliest copy, the earliest copy that we have of Pliny, this kind of agrees with what we had in the other presentation, the other chart, the other slide, was A.D. 850. So between the original and copy, the approximate time span is 750 years for Pliny. Now, maybe a lot of y'all don't know, depends on you know, what your education, environment, and awareness really is, but these are very important documents for, we say, the Western Gentile civilization and all of those fine colleges, those colleges of higher learning, you know, like the Oxfords, the Harvards, and all the rest of it. They study these things. Right? They study these things so deeply that many times they even learn Latin and they even learn Greek, right? Because that's a part of their root culture. Like we say, this is our, right? We talk about the Hebrew and being Israelites. We, the Israelites of Ethiopia, Ethiopian Hebrew connection, Afro Shemitic, Afro Asiatic. This is our roots, but this is their roots, right? So, of course, they're going to put their roots a good shine on it. But one thing we thank them for is at least being somewhat accurate to really reveal that they don't have much to prove Greco-Roman history. And yet people believe that Julius Caesar even existed. You know what? I think he probably did exist in Alexander the Greek, the Greek, the Macedonian, you know. But how do we really know what really occurred? See, they keep spinning these narratives to us, like Julius Caesar. It surprised me because I thought that Julius Caesar was real history until I recognized this is Shakespeare. <laughs> what? This is Shakespeare. And notice they did that with Macbeth and Hamlet and all the rest of that. People take that as history. And it, there might be some historicity to it, but it's actually a play. It's Shakespeare. It's a play. The question is, have you been played? Mine right? says that the old dragon, the serpent that deceived the whole world. Right? So ones are believing that the Bible is iffy. Right? Well, it's iffy. We don't know. It, was, it wasn't written that. It's not that old. They don't have many copies of it. But really, they don't have many copies of the foundation of this Western Gentile civilization. That's why it says, you know, they build their house on sand. Right? What we're doing is just shifting some sand right here. Plato. Plato, right? Date written, they say 427 to 347 BC. The earliest known copy of Plato is 900 years. Approximate time span between the original and the copy. We can't even say carbon copy. Just a, it's a copy, quote, end quote, strong quote. 1,200 years. Number of manuscripts, seven. Notice that for, both for Pliny and Plato, they have seven manuscripts. <laughs> Did they only have seven scribes? <laughs> All right, mm -hmm. Did they only have seven scribes? And the scribes had to first, you know, make up Pliny, and then they have to make up Plato. Right. How about Demosthenes? Demosthenes. Demosthenes? Demosthenes? Fourth century BC. Fourth century before the Christian era. That's roughly around, you know, 300, you know, 400, but coming down to 300, right? Earliest known copy, 1100 AD. What? Demosthenes 
800 year difference. How many manuscripts? Eight. Come on now. Are they playing with numbers here? Only eight? Only eight copies? Only eight copies, copies of Demosthenes? How about Herodotus? I hear a lot of you say, well, Herodotus said such and such. Well, this, when did he live? Well, 800, 480, 480, right between 480 and 425 BC. What's the earliest copy of Herodotus? Right? 900 AD. What? That's 1,300 years. See, on the other one, it was Plato, I think it was 1,200 years. Here we have Herodotus. Herodotus, Herodotus as they say, Herodotus, 1,300 years and how many manuscripts, okay, eight. look at these numbers, eight, there's eight manuscripts for Herodotus or copies rather, copies, but the time span between when the so-called original person did whatever they allege, were alleged to do is 1,300 years, so we're to believe that somehow people just remembered everything? Right? Or was there a copy that was there? What happened to that copy? Right? Somebody just made a copy and destroyed the original? Right? Or did they just make up all of this right, in AD 900? Was this all made up? We don't know. Right? We're just taking their word for it. How about Suetonius? Suetonius. What about Suetonius? Suetonius is AD 75 to 160. This is coming more to like the New Testament time, right? Well, the earliest copy is 950 A.D., right? The time span between the original and the copy, 800 years. You could guess how many copies they got, right? Eight. Eight again. Eight, 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 right? Okay. How about, um, what is this? Thu Thucydides or Thucydides. Thucydides, 460 to 400 B.C., right? Earliest copy is A.D., 900. Now, are we to believe that somehow his works just remained in the library somewhere, right? Or was not in the proper card category or something like that back in the days? And then they just came across it later on? Like, you know, like something like the, his manuscript fell behind the shelf or something like that. And nobody discovered it until um, how many years? 1,300 years. 1,300 years. Interesting that a lot of the earliest copies, have you noticed that a lot of the earliest copies or around the same approximate time AD? Mm. What else was going on in the world? Was that, that wasn't the time of the Renaissance. No, that would happen a little later on, but maybe they were preparing for it, so they had to kind of, yeah. Notice the time, the time is just so interesting, right? All these famous writers and authors, they lived, some of them lived that similar time, but they always at different time, but if you notice that the earliest copies seem to be around the same approximate time. Right? Either it's like 900 or like 1100 A.D. So Thucydides, right, or Thucydides, right, 1300 years between his so-called original and the so-called copy. And how many copies? Eight. What about Euripides? Euripides. Let's look at Euripides. Euripides, 480 to 406 B.C., right? They say sometime in that broad period of time, like over 70 years, right? The earliest known copy is B.C.? Nah, 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 not B.C. No, it's A.D. A.D. 1100. This, is, this too is 1300 years. Is your eyebrow raising up like Spock? You know how Spock would raise that eyebrow right there? Is your eyebrow raising up like what? For real, Euripides. 1300, right? How many number of copies? Nine. Mm. Wow, nine copies, right? One would almost think that these writings were not that important to somebody, right? I thought like the Romans would have made copies of this stuff, but this is what it says right here. How about Aristophanes? Aristophanes, 450 to 385 B.C. You guess this. Can't you guess this? The earliest copy? From the BC is 900, 900. How many works were the earliest copy is like around 900 AD? 900, or they take 50 years off, they say 950, or they add 100 years, say 1000, or add, you know, 200 years, they say 1100. But notice this Aristophanes, 1200 year difference between his alleged original writing, right? 
and the earliest copy that they have, right? The earliest copy, right? The earliest copy is said to be 900 AD, but the man allegedly lived between 450 and 385 BC. Now here they say they don't have nine copies, but 10 copies, <laughs> right? They don't have nine copies, but 10 copies. How about Kaiser? Let's touch on Kaiser or Khazar. Let's touch on Caesar, right? As they say it nowadays in the Oxfordian pronunciation, Caesar, right? But like Caesar, right? We have Caesar between 144 BC, Julius Caesar, right? Earliest known copy, 900 AD. Oh my goodness, all these are 900 AD. Mm. They must have like found a treasure trove or something like that, right? Somebody secret stash. The difference between the time of Caesar and the earliest known AD copy, remember Caesar is BC, but the earliest AD copy is 1,000 years. 1,000 years. So think about all this stuff we hear about Caesar, Julius Caesar, all this stuff we read about Roman history and, you know, in movies and TV and documentary, and people take it as a fact. And he crossed the Rubicon. Uh, well, did, we, did he really? I mean, cross the... But there's 10 copies. There's 10 copies. Ain't that something? There's 10 copies of that, too. 10 copies. How about Livy? Livy, 59 B.C. to A.D. 17. Now, it's not known the date of the earliest copy of Livy. It's not known, therefore, the approximate time span between the original and the copy, because we don't know when the earliest copy, right? But check this out. How many copies of there are of Livy? There are 20. Wow, ain't that something? <laughs> but nobody really knows when. Mm. Okay, Tacitus, we touched on Tacitus. Tacitus, circa AD. Tacitus, the Roman historian. That says some very interesting thing concerning the, um, we say the ethnicity or we could the racial identity of the Jews of roughly of the New Testament time. He said they were of the race, the prolem Ethiopicum. Right, some other things that he says, you know, we have pointed to some of Tacitus' writings, but the date written is said to be AD, 100 AD. It's said that he witnessed some of those events that we have, like, you know, in the New Testament, you know, at least the destruction of the temple and the exile of the Jews and the massacre and all of that, you know, the dispersion that occurred. And he said the Jews, right, that he witnessed were of the race, eth eth uh, Prolem Ethiopicum, he says, right? So there's 1,000 year difference because the earliest known copy is 1100 A.D., right? It is said that he wrote these things at 100 A.D. So the, the earliest known copy right is a thousand years later and they say there are 20 now we have to compare this with the previous one approximately 20 manuscripts right aristotle you heard about aristotle right these are some of the great discoverers of western gentile civilization blase blase you know if anything that they were rewriters of things they were finding you know in egypt and and far east africa falsely called after world war ii the so-called middle east Aristotle, 384 to 322 B.C., right? The earliest known copy is 1100 A.D. The time span difference between when the earliest known copy, right, the earliest known copy and when it is alleged that he lived and wrote is 1400 years, 1,400 years. How many copies? They said it's 49. So somebody regarded Aristotle as being important, so they, they must have copied his manuscript, you know, many times. And they say there's 49 copies. How about Sophocles? Sophocles. Sophocles, 496 to 406 B.C. Earliest known copy, A.D. 100. That's another approximate time span difference between the so-called original and the so-called copy is 1400 years. This is your Greco-Roman history now. Now for Sophocles, they said to be 193 my right, copies. You notice that? That's interesting right there. 193 copies. Now, these copies, is that this 1400 year thing? Now, Notice that one, co one column we didn't touch on was the accuracy. Because in order to tell the accuracy 
there would need to be something that is a little bit earlier. So that means that the accuracy of all of these ancient Greco-Roman documents, historical, these are documents they point to as history, is very, very questionable. This is why when they tell us the story of Greco-Roman history, it's the same narrative over and over. You know, it's almost like the historians and the other, um, you know, intelligentsia of the Western Gentile, the time of the Gentile civilization, they must have decided in some of their Oxfords and Cambridges and in their Harvards and other places, they decided to come up with a narrative to agree, right, to agree on this narrative. That's why the narrative sounds the same. But here's the thing. The accuracy of the narrative is all in question. Right? That's why we're going to ask the question whether Julius Caesar or Alexander the Great ever lived. Do we have any bones of them? You know, when they talk about Moses, did Moses live? Nobody found the body of Moses, of, 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 of Aaron. Nobody found the body of, 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 of Jesus. You know, you know, nobody found the body of, they're looking for people's bodies. You know what I mean? Like they grave robbed ancient Egypt. I mean, we've got something for you for you pro-black cometicists, you know, you, you scribes and Pharisees, right? Pro-black Chemites or Egypt, ancient Egyptites, right? I say this because what they did, right, to the ancient Egyptians, how they disturbed their resting place, their graves, and some of you guys are good with that, and yet all of the art and facts is totally out of black people's hands, right? They, but notice, Nobody ever questioned, well, why don't we start digging around for Julius Caesar? Why don't we start digging around? Why don't we all go, go Europe somewhere, go to Italy? You, you imagine we go to Italy and say we're archaeologists and we want to dig up and see if we can find the graves of Julius Caesar and these Roman people. Have they ever found any bones? They have a lot of marble statues, but you know, most of the marble statues that they pretend to be ancient Roman and Greek, they, many of them were made during, and they say all, oh, many of them were made Right, their fake archaeology, fake, you know, fake art and facts were actually made during the Roman Renaissance. Mm -hmm. Most of that that people think is ancient Greece, like as far as some of the art and facts, you know, um, was actually made later on. They're fakes. They're fakes. Even the whole Constantine thing, the big head guy that you see, they say, oh, that's fake. Because the real Constantine never ruled in Rome, Italy. It was Byzantium, a whole different place. It's all fake. So that means it's a question now, you know, these narratives, right? And we're going to bring our documents, our Israelite of Ethiopia and Judeo-Coptic, Judeo-Christian documents into exhibit as we move forward, Jah willing. But let's look at Homer. The Homer is connected with what's called the Iliad. Now, some people say whether Homer existed or not. You hear them say that, right? Well, we don't know whether Homer really was a real person or not, right? But notice something, for the one that's not a real person, there's more manuscripts. And now, Homer's a little bit different because Homer, we think Homer was a homie, right? And that's what we mentioned, Homer, you know, being an Ethiopian. Remember Prolem Ethiopicum, what Tacitus, a Roman historian, said? He said that the Jews were of the race, the ones he witnessed, right? Because he lived in that approximate time of the Roman Empire, were of the Prolem Ethiopicum, of the race of the Ethiopians, right? So therefore, Homer is probably one of the oldest documents you can see because the date it is said to have been written was 900 BC. And the earliest copies of Homer is 400 BC. All right? Now, of course, that's a 500 year difference, but notice that is the shortest gap. That's the shortest gap that we have here so far concerning Greco-Roman history, documentation, manuscripts. So the shortest gap we get is with Homer and Homer's Iliad. Yet they will put question of whether Homer was a real person. Right? They'll question whether we question whether Lucretius, Pliny, Plato, Caesar, Socrates, you know, whether they were real persons. Right? When we look at the manuscript, we, we, we take Socrates off of that list right now. Just the ones we have on this list right here. So how many copies of Homer? Of Homer and Homer's Iliad. How many copies? We have 643 copies from that ancient time period. So it was allegedly written in 900 BC and the earliest copy of what was allegedly written in 900 BC is from 400 BC. 
500 year gap, 643 copies, and the accuracy. Look at the accuracy. The accuracy of Homer's Iliad is 95% based on the manuscripts. 95. Note that none of the other Roman, Greco Roman history, they can't even give you an accuracy because of the wide time span between the alleged original and the copy and also the low number of manuscripts. If you notice, two, Lucretius, Pliny, and Plato is seven. Um, Demosthenes, uh, Herodotus, uh, Suetonius, uh, Thucydides, right, or Thu, uh, Thucydides, right? We have eight copies, Euripides, nine copies, Aristophanes and Kaiser and Caesar, we have ten copies. Livy is a big question mark. Nobody knows what the earliest copy was and can't really judge the approximate time between original and copy, but here they pump up the number to 20 copies. Tacitus, a Roman historian, 20 copies. Aristotle, right, 40, 49 copies, right? And so Sophocles, Sophocles, right, Sophocles, right, there's actually 193 copies. And even with such a high number of copies and a 1,400-year time span between the alleged original and the copy, they can give us no accuracy because there's nothing to measure it by. But then we come down to Homer, one of the oldest, we could say, documentations that testify to an earlier period of time, right? And what Homer is testifying to is an earlier period of time when they were melanated or for latter day, you know, um, terminology, they were black peoples. Right? But we all know from our archaeological study that there was a very strong black people presence right, in the Mediterranean area of these regions known as Greece, right? the Ionians, you know, these people, they're related. They're also found on the wall paintings and on the monuments of ancient Egypt. And we see them as they looked and they were a melanated brown, reddish brown, dark skinned people. Right, so Homer's Iliad, right, is perhaps one of the oldest documents and one of the more accurate documents based on the 643 copies and based on this time span and looking at the multiple of these copies. I mean, this is hundreds of copies and they give it a 95% accuracy of these copies. Now let's look at the New Testament, because that's what they say. They, they try to throw shade on the New Testament. When we say the New Testament, we're not talking about the King James Version. Let me just say that right here. Can I say that? We're not talking about the King James Version or any of these versions that have come down to us over the past 400 plus years. We're talking about the original copies prior to all of that, before they were translated into the English, the Angeles language. So the New Testament, the date written is the first century A.D., approximately between 50 and 100. Now, the other one said 40 and 100, right? Because some will push up the date, some might push down the date, but we still see this. This is still before 70 AD when Tacitus, Vespasian and Tacitus, that father and son, you know, team attacked Jerusalem, right? And destroyed, murdered, and took into captivity, you know, the tribe of Judah, the remnant of the tribe of Judah that was still in the land, right? And this is a, a significant time for us, right? We, the black Jews of the line of the tribe of Judah, and we, the beta Israel of the West. This is very significant for us. But for call Israel, for all the house of Israel, right? But especially for us in our reasonment right here, because New Testament, first century, AD 50 to 100, the Temple of Jerusalem, right, and we could say the Jewish Judaic national life was destroyed by the Roman Empire in 70 AD, right? Some were killed, right? Some went into slavery. Many fled, right, into what we call today Africa or what would have been Ethiopia, more Tobia, Ethiopia then. They fled into Ethiopia or the continent of Africa. They fled southward. Right? And many cross right? the, the river of Egypt, the river of Ethiopia. But that's a whole other history right there. But the point is 70 AD. Keep in mind 70 AD. Right? Because we can say for the Israelites or for the Judahites, the Yehudi in our land, it ended in 70 AD. Right? 
70 AD with Vespasian, right? Titus and Vespasian, right? These Roman generals that later on would become Roman emperors who erected the monument and say, Iuda Capta, Iuda Capta, Judah was captured, right? In 70 AD. This is why 70 AD is such a significant mark in time, the Tisha B'Av. So we have the earliest copies, right, of the New Testament, right? Second century AD, right? Approximately 130 AD. So now notice something here. Less than 100 years. So the approximate time span between the oldest, right, fragments and, and parchments and writings of what we call the New Testament is less than 100 years. In fact, if we look at the upper number, 50 AD to 100, and then AD 130, that will be roughly 30 years, right? And then if we add another 50 to that, right, we have approximately 80 years. That's why it says less than 100, so an 80-year difference. How many manuscripts, how many copies of manuscripts are there? 5,600, 5,600. And what is the accuracy of this? The accuracy is 99.5% accuracy. Mm. So are, 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 are you telling me? No, let me say it like this. We are telling you that there's more accuracy for the manuscripts, right, that later on will be translated into English. And we can't co-sign the English translation, like the KJV is one of the better translations, but there's a lot of inaccuracies. Right? Especially for us of this resurrection awakening generation. We need to go to the Hebrew and even to the Koine Greek. Right? But here we have a 99.5% accuracy. Right? Now notice that. The only ones that can even give us an accuracy is Homer. Notice that the time span there is very close. Right? And it's in the BC times. And here we have in the first century AD time, right, 80 years Right, less than 100 years between the written date when these things were written and between the earliest copies that are still extant, like are still available. And there's 5,600 copies and from the ones who have studied these copies, they give it a 99.5% accuracy. Now, before we go to the next exhibit, Let's go right here to the notes down here. So the note says that there are thousands more New Testament Greek manuscripts than any other ancient writing. I want to say this right here. When it says Greek manuscripts, there's also other languages, right? You know, Aramaic and even some archaic, some older Hebrew. And there's other manuscripts, right? Even the Ge'ez. Right? We also have the Ge'ez, the Ethi There's other manuscripts. The internal consistency of the New Testament documents is about 99.5 textually pure. In other words, accuracy. Right? In addition, there are over 19,000 copies. Right? Speaking about the New Testament. In Syriac. Right? In Syriac. In Latin. In Coptic. Right, and in Aramaic languages, the total supporting New Testament manuscript base is over 24,000. Over 24,000. And notice all these different languages. Right? All these different languages. Right? So here the source on this is something called Christian Apologetics and Resource Ministry. But much of this evidence can be found even from those who are not Christian apologetics. The ones might say, oh, you're using Christian apologetics. Well, 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 watch. The Here, John Henry Clark is said to have said in the Ethiopian Bible, there's only one white character, the devil. Now, when we say the Ethiopian Bible, remember, there's ancient, older manuscripts, and there is newer more recent manuscript. But John Henry Clark said this, you know what? Enough said. Weep not behold, right? Conquering line of the tribe of Judah. This man was born there. This man was born there. 
Psalm 87, right? Verse 4. Im kush ze yulad sham. With Ethiopia, this man was born there. All right, calling, calling, calling. So here, 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 we have ancient manuscript, right? Here, here, here. So here, 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 we have ancient manuscript detail comparison, right? Ancient manuscript detail comparison. Let's zoom in on this right here. Let's zoom in on this so one can see this well. Now, we went over most of this right here, right? Most of it's pretty consistent. Right, from the evidence that we've seen elsewhere, right? And we went to a couple of different sites. You know, some of them were not Christian sites, but were more academic, scholarly sites. Some of them were Christian sites, Christian apologetics. And we saw there was a, a lot of, 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 of um, likeness and sameness of their information. So we see they're drawing from the same information, whether they are you know, academic, you could say secular scholars, or whether they're more Christian apologetics. We talk about Caesar already. We know the, you know, 1,000 year difference in Caesar. We spoke about Livy, right? Plato, right? Tetralogies. His work was called Tetralogies, right? Um, the 1,200 year difference, seven copies, Tacitus, the annals, right, of the Roman history, right? We know there was 20 copies. Also, there was other minor works, Right? There's like a 900 year difference, but one copy of his other minor works. Pliny the Younger, this is all on history, right? These are ones who wrote history. Here it has a date of 61 to 113 AD, 850 AD, 750 year difference between the original writings, right? And 750 years, la years later, seven copies. My um, Thucydides, right? Or Thucydides, right? History as well, the 900 AD, the 1300 years, eight copies, Suetonius, right? De Vita, um, Casarium, right? Casarium, right? We have that 800 year difference as well, eight copies. Herodotus wrote on history, right? There's, there's that 1300 year time span between the BC time that he allegedly wrote these works. Right during the Greek times, and then we have 900 AD, the earliest copy, and eight copies. There's one named Horus, right? Horake, Horake, aka Horus. They can't tell us when it was written, they can't tell us the earliest copy, but they say a time span of 900 years. 900 years from what? And they can't even tell us the number of copies. So that means they have this thing called Horake or Horus. And there's no accuracy of information of when anything happened. But still, this is, you know, nobody questions this, right? Sophocles, right? We touched on Sophocles, right? And his had the most, 193 manuscripts, but a 1,400-year difference. He lived in the B.C. times, the Greek times, and it was 1,000 A.D., the earliest copy. So about 1,400-year difference. But to their credit, there's 193 copies of it. Remember before? Looking at accuracy, they can't tell us accuracy. Lucretius, Lucretius, touch on him, died 55 or 53 AD, right? Can't tell us when the earliest copy, but they say between when he lived and died, about 1100 year difference, only two copies, right? Catullus, Catullus, 54 BC, right? 1550 AD. Now, this becomes a little suspicious here, right? 1550 AD was the earliest copy. 1600 year difference. How many copies? Three copies, right? Euripides, right? 480 to 406, 1100 AD, 1500 year difference, nine copies. Demosthenes, touched on him, 383, uh, 383 to 322 BC, 1100 AD, 1300 copies. Now here they say 200 all from one copy. See, I'm happy they gave this information because some would say, oh look, um, Demosthenes, Demosthenes, there are 200 
copies, right? Even though there's a 1300 year difference from BC when he allegedly wrote it during the Greek, -o, the Greek times, right? The Hellenistic times, right? 1100 AD, the so-called earliest copy that they know of. Therefore, a 1300 year difference, but note what they say of the number of copies. 200 copies, all from one copy. So they copy, 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 copy. So all of them is from one copy. Aristotle, 384 to 322 BC, 1100 AD, 1400 year difference, 49. So Demosthenes, remember on the other one we just said 49 copies? But here's the part that the other one didn't share, but we share here. They're all from one work. So these copies were copied from one particular work. Now, when they were copied, we don't know. Lastly but not leastly, Aristophanes. 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 450 to 385 BC. The earliest copy was sometime in the AD. When? 900 AD. How much time is that? 1,200 years. 1,200 years. How many copies? 10 copies. Okay. Homer Iliad. Right? So notice how the numbers are consistent. 900 BC, the earliest time that it's known that it was most likely written. Earliest copy that they found was 400 BC. The time difference was 500 years. How many copies? 400. Uh, how many copies? 643. 643. All these numbers. Don't want to get dyslexic. Right? 643 copies. Right? Homer. Now, let's look at the New Testament and Old Testament. This is why we want to touch on the Old Testament as well. Now, for the New Testament, when written? 40 to 100 A.D. Now, allegedly, they say that Christ was crucified. There's different dates that people give, and we know that the calendar has been rearranged, and the Gregorian has totally messed up the calendar. But it's working with even that calendar right now as a point of reference, right? 40 to 100 AD. When was Christ crucified? Some, we read some writings and researched some writings. Some try to say 27 AD. But of course, what they're doing is juggling the seven to eight years. So if we add the seven to eight years to that, if we add seven years to, to 27 AD, we have something like 34 AD. So some say 34 AD. Some have even said 37 AD. So this means that the New Testament, the first writings that have been found and recovered in the New Testament was written right in the same time period of the actual events. See, this is what they want to hide from you. They want to make it seem like, well, nothing was written down concerning Christ until hundreds of years later on. Or they try to say during the time of Constantine. And they just lie on Constantine. For real, they lie on Constantine. Now, how do we know this? Because we have an independent witness my, from the Judeo-Coptic Ethiopian witness, right? And they were also witness to those events that occurred, right, circa the 3rd and the 4th century A.D. But the New Testament, 40, right, 40, okay, bro, hold on for a moment right here. I have to call my brother back right here. Let me just say that right there to him. So, New Testament, 40 to 100 A.D., right? 125 AD was the earliest copy. So, according to this, this is like a 25 year difference. Before it was saying less than 100 years, when we did the math, we could either say between 30 to 80 years, right? 30 to 80 years. This is saying that the difference between the first writing, right, of what we know as the Brit Chadasha, the New Testament, scrolls, manuscripts, fragments, parchments. Right? And the earliest copy that they have able to recover is 125 A.D., which makes 25-year difference. Notice that tightness there. And how many manuscripts do you have? One or two? 24,000. Remember the number that we gave before? When including not just the Greek. Remember, first it was talking about the Greek manuscripts. Right? Something like 5,600. But then if we include the Syriac, the Coptic, the Latin, the Aramaic, you know what I mean? We have something of the order of 24,000. So when we include not just those in Greek, because a lot of ones we try to say the New Testament was only written in Greek. Was all, all these are lies that they keep repeating, and most people never do any kind of research on their own.
right? You can end it nowadays with Daniel's prophecy. Knowledge shall go to and fro, modulation, demodulation. You can just look it up for yourself, right? Knowledge shall increase, right? Old Testament. Old Testament, here they say, right? And we dispute this date right here based on some other manuscripts and some other intel. But we still say, let's just hold this here for the record. Old Testament, between 800 and 400 B.C., right? 800 and 400 B.C., right? The earliest copy of what was said to be written between 800 and 400 B.C. You have to remember that Solomon's temple, the visit of the Queen of Sheba, roughly occurred sometime between 900 B.C. to 1000. Like 1000 to like 900 B.C. is when we have Solomon's temple and we also have the visit of Queen Makeda, Belkis, Queen Ida, some of the names of the Queen of Sheba to King Solomon in Jerusalem. I point that out because the writing of the Old Testament is right in that approximate time period with a hundred year or so difference, right? When the kingdom of Yisrael, Israel, and Judah was still united, you know, it was still a, still a kingdom. They were still there, right? Before Israel went into captivity and then later on Judah went into captivity between 700 and then 500, those events. So the Old Testament, 800 to 400 B.C., a lot of people like to choose the lower date. They say, oh, it was first written in 400 B.C., right? Because they're looking at one source, but not really doing a full study of all the resources out there. The earliest known copy, they say, is between 250 to 200 B.C. The earliest copy that is like on hand that they're able to point to. You know, archaeologically and, and linguistically and point to, they say, is between earliest copies, 250 to 200 B.C. Now, that's a difference, right, of 150, right, a difference of 150 years, right, the difference of 150 years. Now, looking at the math right here between that, right, a roughly... It seems like the numbers will be a little different there. And I'm just going to say this, just doing the math. You know, um, our math is okay, but it can be always better. You know, practice make perfect. It seems as though, you know, the difference is a little bit more than that, right? But there's probably some other facts, right? But here's the thing. Even of the Old Testament, there are 14,000 copies, right? And the majority was speaking about Hebrew, but also in other languages, like even the Ethiopic documents, there are like two sets of main sets of Ethiopic documents. There are the Ethiopic documents from the Old Testament, the Hebrew period of time, and there are Ethiopic documents from the New Testament, the Septuagint and the New Testament, and the Syretic, the Syriac, for the nine saints, they came from Syria. So when they brought forward their scrolls, people always say it was Septuagint, but actually it was the Syriac and also some uh, Aramaic as well as the Coptic influence of these documents. I point that out just to show that it's deeper than what they want to make you believe. But it's 1,400, uh, no, no, 14,000, my bad, 14,000 for the Old Testament. And it says right here, let's just go down this right here, the science of textual criticism, right? The science of textual criticism. Now, it, there's three tests, right? Take note of this, three tests. First is proximity. How close to the event was the document written? Second test is frequency. How many copies of the event are in possession? The third test of textual criticism is corruption. How significant are the differences? So even in some of the Greek manuscripts, for example, there's some difference in some of the Greek manuscripts. And sometimes it could be maybe a word, a phrase, a phraseology here or there. But otherwise, right, the main events are accurately being testified to. Right? But there can be corruption too. Because in some cases, the difference in some wording right, brings into other things into mind. Maybe even theological questions. Why is this here? And in this manuscript, these verses was not found, but we find them over here. So this is what is taught spoken of as a third test corruption so there's three text uh tests in textual criticism this is a science so we talk about bible and linguistic people say oh we're talking about mythology or spookism no for us we're talking about science we're talking about knowledge 
right? And not just knowledge of what's in the text, but knowledge concerning the ancient,cy of the text and the accuracy of the text and how many different languages and the linguistics of language. Language itself is linguistics. Right, and we've been seeking to show and prove this from our vlogs, where we'll take, uh, you know, something in the King James version, and then start to look at it in the Hebrew, and then compare it with the Ethiopic or the Amharic or with the Greek or with, you know, the other ancient testifiable languages. And if you notice, always when they talk about Bible stuff, they always try to late date and leave our black people's research talking about. The Beta Israel of Ethiopia, the Israelites of Ethiopia, the Judeo Coptic, all of that, they leave that out. But look at these three tests proximity, frequency, and corruption. How does the Bible reliably compare with classical antiquity peers? Right? I think it was the same one who says that in the Ethiopian Bible, the only white character, the only white character is, um, is the devil, right? That was uh, John Henry Clark. Right? And I know he must have been looking at some of the older manuscripts, right? Because there's, there's later manuscripts. You remember that we have a living culture, right? And one thing about many of these cultures, like say the Ethiopian culture, is much similar to the biblical culture because of the proximity of where they were at. Not like in Egypt. Egypt is a dry place, don't get no rain and everything. So manuscripts and other things can't survive for a long time. In other regions of the world where there are regular rainy seasons and everything else, manuscripts often have to be recopied, right? Recopied after, you know, a period of time, right? But the good thing is that since many of these scriptural manuscripts are not destroyed, sometimes they're able to find some treasure trove like the Genizera, right? Genizera, like, you know, where they actually have put up, you know, many of these scrolls because they don't want to destroy them. So sometimes in looking at these fragments and comparing them with the later writing is how they're able to say, wow, even though this was written more recently, you know, or later on, it's very accurate to these fragments that we know are well older than a later writing. But how does the Bible reliably compare with classical antiquity peers? Well, New Testament and Old Testament. Proximity, right? Earliest within 100 years of original. Fragments of some to within 50 years. Now, Often when we speak about fragments, the fragments that have been found and recovered are very important because though they're not the whole thing, these fragments we can compare it with the area that we have the more fuller, you know, manuscript and see the accuracy. But here the first thing is the proximity. How long after the events testified to were these things written down? And even in the biblical narrative, we know that Moshe is found even in the Torah or the five books of, you know, from, from Genesis, uh, Exodus, uh, Leviticus, uh, Numbers, and Deuteronomy to writing. It says that Moses wrote this and wrote that, and others also wrote this, and he gave it to the priests, and the priests were writers, and the children of Israel were commanded to write these things on their gates. So that means that literacy was high among the biblical Hebrews and Israelites. I'm talking about the Israelites. Not the mixed multitude of other people. Maybe they were literate too. You understand? Know but among the children of Israel who were given Ha Torah, right? All others, when we now look at classical antiquity, the Greco Roman thing, from 400 to 1500 years distant. So sometimes we get a close proximity as we did with Homer and Homer's Iliad. Other times we get up to 1500 year difference. Right? Between when the original writing was alleged to be written and when the earliest manuscript right, has been recovered. Next is the frequency. The number of copies are 39,000 plus. Right? Remember, on this they didn't mention Ethiopic or other things and there are other evidences. But let's just go with this evidence right here. Just with the evidence that they present here, there are 39,000 copies, frequency. So that means, and when we say frequency, we're talking about different communities, right? We're talking about the Old Testament, New Testament, different communities of Hebrews, of Jews, of Israelites, you know, of, of Yehudi, of Jews that had faith in the Messiah, right? Of ones that continue with the more Old Testament Judaic tradition. When we put all of that together, Right? And also converts and others who also copied and wrote out things. We put all of that together, we have 39,000 plus. For all others, 
we have between the frequencies between two, we showed you that already in this, right? To 643. And the 643 is Homer's Iliad. And many would dare say, well, Homer, if he ever existed, but there's more for him than they are for the ones who we actually are told actually existed. So did Julius Caesar ever exist? Did he really exist? And if he did exist, is he the same as we've been told and made to believe in Shakespeare's Julius Caesar? Corruption. Of the 20,000 New Testament lines of text, 40 lines are in doubt. So those who have critically studied, when we speak about corruption in the New Testament, of the 20,000 New Testament lines of text, going line by line, this is science here, scientifically speaking, linguistic science, right? There are 40 lines in doubt, right? 40 lines that are in doubt. That means one half of 1% of the total lines in the New Testament that are in doubt, right? There's one half of 1%, right? What does that be, be, be 0.5 or something like that, right? There's, there is 40 lines that are in doubt, 40 lines. That means we look at a line, right? Not even saying a full verse, but we look at a line and then we look at other texts and look at all these texts, right? I think it's 24,000 for, for, the, for, for the New Testament. So we're talking about the New Testament here. There's only 40 lines that are in doubt. Right? The differences cause no appreciable significance. So it's even said that these lines that are in doubt are not really significant areas right, of, of narrative, of doctrine, of teaching, or testimony witnessing of events. Right? 40 lines out of 20,000 lines. What about the others? What about the other Gre Greco-Roman you know, so-called documents? Well... There's not enough copies to determine accurately. Ain't that a shame? There's not enough copies. Right? There's not enough copies to determine ac it could be real accurate, it could be real not accurate. But what we're seeing here is there's more accuracy with the Old and New Testament. Right? There's more accuracy with the Old and New Testament than there is with Greco and Roman history combined. Now, we touched on this before right here, just to read the first part. There are 5,686 Greek New Testament manuscripts in existence today. Remember, we're just talking about the Greek ones. We also have the Syretic, we have the Coptic, right? We even have the Latin, the early old Latin. We also have the Aramaic, right? And believe it or not, there's also Hebrew fragments of the New Testament. Remember, the people were Hebrew speakers, Hebrew and Aramaic speakers. Now, compared to other ancient writings, just looking at the Greek, the New Testament manuscripts far outweigh others in quantity and accuracy, right? In quantity and accuracy. 18 New Testament manuscripts, right, are from the second century and one from the first century, it is said. 18 New Testament manuscripts that they have can have been dated to be from the second century, right? That's about 130 years, roughly, after the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem and the diaspora of the Yehudi, the Jews, right? And one from the first, right? There says to be one from the first century. And once again, these, these numbers we already went through, you know, I think ones get the idea. And the only ones they're able to test the accuracy of is the New Testament, Right, as well as the Old Testament, but here speaking of the New Testament and Homer's Iliad. Homer's Iliad is 95% accurate, although ones will say it sounds like mythology, but it's 95% accurate. And I say this to you, it is more accurate, right, right, as far as ancient history than all the rest of this that we have been made to believe, make believe history. And the New Testament, well, 99.5. This is just looking at the 5,686 manuscripts. There's a 99.5%. And this is just looking at the Greek manuscripts and the Greek manuscripts, but there have been other studies of Greek to other languages, like the Syriac, the Syretic, right? Like the, like the Aramaic, like the Coptic, and even the Latin that shows there is a great accuracy. 
right? There's a great accuracy, but the gaps that we find in Greco-Roman history should cast doubt on all of this Greco-Roman history that we have been made to be lie, been made to believe.